to the CNI Digital Scholarship Planning Webinar Series. And if you participated in previous sessions, welcome back. I know many of you are working from home and some of you are back on campus. I hope you're all doing well during this difficult time of the pandemic. I'm Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita of CNI, and I'm the moderator of this nine part series. If you've missed some webinars or would like to rewatch or share the presentations, we have recordings available for the first eight sessions, as well as a set of questions to guide planning discussions on your own campus. This is the ninth and final session of this webinar series and will follow a different format than the earlier sessions. We have a panel of three individuals and I'll be asking them a set of questions about successes of library-based digital scholarship programs, roadblocks to success, getting a seat at the institutional table, and reflections on how digital scholarship programs might change after the pandemic. We'll take questions from participants at the end, and then I'll present a short wrap up to the series. Please type your questions in the chat box at any time. In addition, after the formal one hour session is over, we'll open the mics in case some of you wish to verbally ask questions. The chat box is also available to communicate with each other or with me or our technical lead, Beth Sechrist. During the presentations in the panel, all participants will be muted. And now I'd like to welcome our distinguished panelists. Dan Cohen, Vice Provost for Information Collaboration, Dean of the Library and Professor of History at Northeastern University. You may also know him from his work as Executive Director of the Digital Public Library of America or DPLA, and his work as Director of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. Next, Tom Hickerson is the former Vice Provost for Libraries and Cultural Resources at the University of Calgary, and before that, the Associate University Librarian for Information Technologies and Special Collections at Cornell University Library. Next, Patricia Sway is the Program Officer for Public Knowledge at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Previously, she worked in the libraries at Penn State University, where she co-founded the Department of Publishing and Curation Services, now the Department of Research Informatics and Publishing, and she was originally a Russian literature scholar. More extensive biographies are on our website. So welcome to our panelists. And I'm gonna start with a question. From your perspective, what have been the major successes of library-based digital scholarship programs in recent years? And I'd like to start with you, Dan. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks so much, Joan. And I, I first just wanna thank you for organizing this series and for your continued leadership in terms of disseminating best practices around digital scholarship. I think the entire community really appreciates all of your work. Um, also great to be here with Patricia and Tom, and I'm looking forward to this hour. Um, so your question is a good one, I think, about the, the major successes. And I, I think what I'd like to focus on in just my two minutes are just um, a sort of larger point, which is I think when we think about digital scholarship, we tend to think about projects or software initiatives. But I would really focus when we talk about success on some broader or meta issues. And namely that digital scholarship um, programs, I think, at their best success, I think, have done this important role of connecting parts of the university. So for instance, connecting faculty from different departments together, say computer science and history, or design and journalism, um, or connecting those outside the library with critical uh, departments within the library, such as the archives. Um, and I also think within the library, they play this sort of connective role as well. Um, you know, I think earlier on, maybe a decade or two ago, digital scholarship programs were distinct, were, were sort of separate units, but I think the best um, digital scholarship groups have actually joined elements within the library in addition to this larger role in the university. Um, so facilitating, for instance, um, the uh, transmission of digit digitized materials into teaching and learning programs within the library or allowing uh, a metadata group that might have been working on the back end 
of um, the library with the front end research program within the library. So that's really what I would summarize is that at least in recent years, some of the key advances that digital scholarship programs have made. Thank you, Dan. Really important points. Patricia, how about you? What, what is your perspective? Yeah, um, well, uh, collaboration was going to be one of uh, the things that I said, uh, was going to say, and I'm so glad that you, um, that you started off with that, Dan, and, uh, and articulated that. I think another um, uh, success of digital scholarship programs could be the roles, the different roles that have emerged in libraries as a result of um, investing in these kinds of activities. Um, 10 years ago, we didn't have digital scholarship librarians um, and uh, we didn't have folks who were doing data services as part of that realm. Um, so I think this has been very, um, it's been sort of like an injection of, um, uh, you know, um, innovative approaches to um, doing research that is digitally inflected um, and having that kind of support has been uh, really key. The only other thing that I would say is because of that kind of support and because of support for um, support for those new roles as well support as support for um, digital scholarship. There's also been um, it's also been possible to realize an almost fully digital research workflow. And if I were showing slides today, I would be showing a slide that my former foundation colleague Don Waters used to show, um, which shows how we have gone from um, a sort of physical based workflow to a digital workflow using digitized materials, being able to encode those materials, being able to um, transcribe um, OCR text, being able to um, interpret uh, web-based content or digitized materials via annotation, for example, um, and even trying to crack the um, challenge of digitally publishing um, uh, scholarship. So uh, those two things, digital scholarship um, services, uh, support roles, and um, being able to uh, support a digital research workflow. Thank you, Patricia. Interesting points. Tom, how about you? Well, <clears throat> pardon me. First, I want to say uh, hello to everyone, um, particularly to uh, voice my uh, pleasure in uh, joining with my uh, uh, distinguished colleagues uh, here this morning, but everyone that's participating and everyone that's participated in this very impressive series. Digital scholarship programs are, are particularly important because they provided a different model for libraries to interact and align with today's academic research. It positions the library to move beyond traditional collection-based strengths and transactional services. When I discuss traditional strengths of the library with an associate dean research in the arts faculty at Calgary, he responded, but we don't do research like that anymore. Digital scholarship programs give us the opportunity to reshape our role directly in response to new and multidisciplinary forms of research and teaching. As you have heard throughout this series and, and ah, just remarkable presentations throughout, these collaborations have identified for scholars and students evolving library capacities that are of particular value today. It also positions libraries well in the development of new organizational partnerships on campus and, and greatly beyond the campus, something that was, was illustrated by uh, a number of the presentations. So it's a, a very special opportunity for us um, that we are that, that's come open to us through these digital scholarship programs. Thank you, Tom. I, I'm curious whether each of you believes that in the case of the successes in the working with new forms of scholarship, with reaching out to faculty and uh, administrators in the university, with integrating it into the entire library, with integrating the workflow for digital uh, programs. Is it, in your view, top down? Does it start with a leadership? Is it bottom up? Is it a combination? What do you think um, helps move 
things along within a library. Dan? Um, sure. Uh, I, can I take all the above? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I, I really want to underline Patricia's great point, which um, I think the development actually of some some new roles, um, which act as kind of facilitators, I think, um, people, you know, digital scholarship librarians who really see the full picture, have the tech literacy, understand some of the traditional library roles that that Tom uh, mentioned as well, um, but that it can also act as a very strong outreach and partner and collaborator with faculty uh, strikes me as being uh, really key. Um, but uh, as I'm sure we'll discuss later in the hour, there are also organizational and financial and all kinds of issues where I do think um, leadership uh, matters. Um, and, and then I also, um, you know, going back to my days at uh, George Mason, um, I, I also think that digital scholarship um, institutions have been very good at sort of bubbling up great ideas from every level of staff. I think um, unlike um, other parts of a university that may be, let's say, a little bit more faculty driven, um, what's been wonderful to see, and, to, and I've been at a few places where this has happened, um, is, is to see um, everyone from, um, you know, software developers to metadata specialists to archivists to those digital scholarship librarians, uh, develop ideas that can be transmitted around. I think it's a really special thing that um, unlike the sort of solitary faculty member working on a monograph, which of course is always overblown, right? They're also collaborating with archivists and librarians and so forth. But I really think in digital scholarship environments, you have the chance to have, um, you know, half dozen, a dozen people working together on a project. And it, it, it sort of encourages a, um, a really fertile interaction between folks who have different roles within that kind of an organization and can pursue new ideas because of um, that, the hive mind that occurs within those digital scholarship programs. Thank you. Tom, please go ahead. I will, um, pardon me. I want to um, pick up on the, uh, on the last point that uh, that Dan made and speaking to a number of projects um, that uh, research projects in various uh, disciplinary areas, one of the things that was it was so special about this um, was that in fact those scholars work directly with a variety of library staff who normally don't have that kind of interaction. And it was so exciting for them um, to be able to sit at the table and offer suggestions, uh, to have their knowledge and their expertise appreciated by the researchers in a very explicit fashion. Um, I, I, um, we had hired a very new metadata librarian. And so she was in her first professional year and she commented later that she had never imagined that when she was a new librarian, she would be sitting at the table directly interacting with scholars and how this had just raised her appreciation of her knowledge set, um, but also in her role in research and her role in the university. And I, I think for many staff, it identified them uh, after working, you know, in the quote back room for so long, uh, suddenly they were playing a uh, a part in the university, and uh, in a way that they had not uh, perceived before. So mm -hmm. a really exciting uh, uh, enhancement for staff. Thanks, Patricia. Anything you'd like to add on this point or something else? Um, I think you know just. Building on uh, what's been said um, in terms of um, all of the above, um, the leadership is generally uh, the place where the funding, you know, that makes possible the funding for these kinds of roles and, and for these kinds of programs. I think sometimes what can get overlooked is the fact that the leadership and maybe middle managers can also help facilitate um, 
some better understanding about what digital scholarship is, um, what it involves, and um, having um, understanding that it is uh, extremely team-based. Sometimes that's not articulated, I think, um, when roles like that are introduced or when programs like that are introduced. So I guess I have a, uh, my, my contribution here is a flavor of what um, Dan has said. Thank you. Well, let's move on to our next question, uh, where there are successes, there have also normally been some roadblocks. So what do you believe have been the major roadblocks to success of the development of digital scholarship programs? Because some of what you described in response to the first question, from my point of view, was rosy and wonderful. But I also hear some stories that aren't so rosy and wonderful. And what do you think accounts for that? Um, let's start with Patricia on this one. So um, digital scholarship uh, programs and projects often um, get started because of grant funding or soft funding. And um, it's usually because of a nifty new idea um, uh, or um, software application or platform um, that is the attraction, right, to funders. And all that is great in getting uh, the initiative started, uh, but what happens when the funding runs out and um, there hasn't been the institutional investment, perhaps that was anticipated, that can take over, or that can continue um, the effort that was started. Um, what I'm trying to get at here is not only the fact that, you know, we as funders tend to be attracted to what's innovative and, and new and shiny, but the fact that we also, and we meaning funders as well as higher education institutions, libraries, archives, where these activities take place, still don't understand as well as we should what it takes to persist a digital scholarship program and what it takes to maintain the activities that have begun and that have flourished, but that need um, continual funding or eventually even some capital to keep them going and to update them. So I think that that's definitely a weakness that we are so focused on the innovative and the shiny that we don't, we forget that there needs to be some attention to repair and maintenance down the road, even for positions. Um, you know, a lot of these positions are hired singly um, rather than as a team. And there can be some burnout um, in these positions. Um, so I would say that has been a roadblock. And I'll just um, introduce one additional um, roadblock. And that is, as, um, as, as vital as these programs have become, and as popular as they've become, I mean, they are obviously um, uh, uh, a very rich part of the library organization. There hasn't been still a, you know, some uptake in promotion and tenure guidelines to support the outputs of these programs. So you can do all that work as a faculty, but you still struggle to get credit for it. And so that's something that I think will need resolution over time. It isn't a new problem, um, but again, like the maintenance problem, it's something that um, needs attention and is that exciting to address like a new software application. Really important points. Thank you. How about you, Tom? What do you see as the roadblocks? Well, I'll uh, start out first. Um, Patricia has uh, spoken to the limitation of, uh, of funding by uh, the Mellon Foundation and other similar uh, funding supporters. Uh, but I want to want to say how important that funding has been. Uh, and uh, and yes, we need that uh, funding for innovation. Um, and I will say that, um, that the funders are often very creative contributors themselves. And so that we should see them as part of the environment in which we, uh, which we work. Um, I will say, uh, as uh, Patricia uh, indicated, um, digital scholarship programs have drawn a good deal of positive attention within libraries, but often they're not organizationally embraced as core components of the library's support for campus research. So ongoing substantial funding has not been reallocated from other areas of library operation that may not be so important today and reallocated to sustain and expand the impact of digital scholarship programs. 
some tough decisions have to be made to realize the full potential. Permanent staffing is sometimes minimal and service support is often dependent on, staff, on student wages. Grants shared with academic departments are often short term and do not always build stable capacity. We've also sometimes been constrained by our focus on the humanities. All research is digital and our functional strengths are not disciplinary in their scope of application. Metadata services and visualization are vital for climatologists and medical researchers, as well as for literary scholars. I agree, Tom, really important points. Thank you. And Dan, what do you think are some major roadblocks? Uh, sure, some of these will probably be footnotes to my colleagues on the panel, but um, I guess the first thing actually I would say is that I think some of the, the hurdles or roadblocks are, they're the flip side of what we discussed in the first question, which is that um, as exciting as it is to play a collaboration or coordination role, actually those roles are very hard. Um, when I was at the Digital Public Library of America, um, probably some people on this call have heard me say this, that I, I viewed it more as a a social or political project rather than a technical project. I mean, it had technical aspects, but it had to do with coordination and collaboration among thousands of libraries, archives, and museums. And that's just very difficult. And within a university environment where, as Patricia noted, people might have um, variable incentives, um, particularly those who might be on a, a tenure track uh, line, um, you know, those, those, tensions can arise as part of collaboration around projects. Um, I'd also say again, as a flip side of what I uh, said earlier, um, in terms of the benefits of digital scholarship programs, um, things that are um, bet betwixt and between, um, things that are not quite in a department, maybe not quite in a library are often hard to sustain. This is just, you know, organizational management 101, I think. There are a lot of institutes and centers in a university that are wholly within a department or within a home college. Those are often much easier to find sustainable funding um, beyond the sort of venture capital of grant funding. Um, and so the, you know, I, I think thinking about something that spans multiple parts of an organization is actually quite hard and probably some more thought needs to be applied um, in that area. Um, finally, I'll just say, and I really do think this is a, a footnote to, to Tom and Patricia, um, I, I'm not sure I know of a single digital scholarship uh, program that is not overstretched. Um, I, I think these are, tend to be, you know, um, very um, um, talented and caffeinated um, sets of people who really want to work on a lot of new software projects and want to collaborate with not only people at their own institution, but actually, um, you know, nationally and internationally with others. I, I think it's a very online group. And um, so when that happens, what you have is a sort of mismatch of ambition with capacity. And I, I think that, um, that that also is an ongoing program. I, I know it's just hard to kind of do everything that these digital scholarship groups want to do. I think some of the participants, getting back to the collaboration part, some of the participants in a digital scholarship program may not understand the amount of work that would go into a specific, let's say, new project or new feature. And so you often have this kind of um, um, the demands on the digital scholarship group within the library outstripping uh, the capacity. And I think that's also an ongoing hurdle. Thank you. Do any of you wish to comment further on your colleagues or amplify your comment? I'm going to ask then, um, Dan or others, I have found very few digital scholarship programs that have clear guidelines on what they will or won't accept as a project. And do you think that I'm being too kind of rational in expecting that kind of thing to develop, say, as a 
long ago reference librarian, you had usually some guidelines as to what types of questions you would spend what amount of time on and, you know, follow up and that kind of thing, uh, which is, of course, much more limited in scope. But do you think that that's a step as programs mature that they could take or not particularly? Uh, so, you know, I'll say on that, it's, it, I, I like the idea of setting up guidelines. <laughs> I've certainly tried to do it in, in my own context. It, in reality, it's, it's, I think it's actually kind of hard because I think a lot of digital scholarship, because it's um, emergent, mm -hmm. it, it's a little bit amorphous and it's, it, it's actually hard to maybe know at the beginning of a project, um, you know, how much work something is. I mean, you definitely know certain parts of the parameters. Um, what, what I, my party line on this is maybe not to rule anything out, but to see if you can sort of um, really work with, with others to define the scope better. Um, and even more importantly, to shoehorn it wherever possible into existing platforms and structure, structures that you have in your own digital scholarship program. So, you know, for, uh, for me, you know, if you can, take a project and put it in Omeka, um, you know, uh, thanks to the funding of um, the Mellon Foundation and others. Um, it was developed and is still ongoing. Um, those platforms, you know, help to reduce the kind of um, structural load, the cognitive load, the maintenance load um, that, that has to happen. Um, the sustainability, I think, becomes better. So I think as long as you work to, again, not just reduce the scope, but to say, you know what, we can't have all the bells and whistles, um, we can, but if we put it on in this existing structure that we know, we know how to run, we know how to use, we have people who are expert in that area, um, then we can go forward with it. So I think it's a sort of two-pronged approach there. Thank you. Tom, go ahead. So a, a, a point on, uh, on this interaction um, is when you really have people in digital scholarship programs working closely with um, researchers in their projects and with their graduate students, um, one of the things that we need to be quite open about is what we can do and what we can't do. Um, we would love to do it all. And researchers would love for us to do it all uh, in many cases. But um, we, need, we need to have a real conversation. And one of the things that uh, researchers have uh, commented to uh, us in some of our grant programs is, we don't know what you can do or how much you can do. And um, so I think an important element of what uh, Dan has just described is, um, is having a good common understanding among the staff and their capacity to convey that to, the, to their research partners. Thank you. Patricia, anything to add or ready to move? Um, only that um, I think, you know, uh, both of these approaches speak to flexibility. Um, I do like the idea of having um, guidance because I think guidance can also reflect strategy for the digital scholarship program. Um, if you know what you'll accept, you know you're doing that because of um, strategic priorities for the program. Um, but I do understand that sometimes there are things of the moment. Um, a particular team is coming together organically and you want to be able to take advantage of that. And so I think building in flexibility uh, for those kinds of opportunities is really important. And understanding the planning, a planning phase um, can go a long way. Thank you. We'll go on to our next question. All three of you have commented and we've heard throughout this series how important it is to take an institutional view of digital scholarship, what's happening in other parts of the institution. And it's really important, I think, for libraries to have a seat at the table, whatever that table is. Actually, it's often several tables where institutional processes, decisions, and budgets for infrastructure, for technologies, for support, for storage, for all kinds of things are being made. 
and, and resources allocated. So I'd like to know if you have recommendations for how libraries can get a seat at those tables. And let's start with you, Tom. Um, we need to be at all the tables. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, and I think that that opportunity is available to us and we need to be strategic um, about our pursuit of those opportunities. And we need to be strategic in marketing knowledge of our, of, of really what is a redefinition um, for research libraries today. Um, digital scholarship programs uh, bring a diversity of, of library strengths together uh, to enhance research and teaching. And uh, these strengths include visualization, metadata services, GIS, web development, VR, AI, maker spaces, special collections, copyright services, digitization, and data curation repository services. Who doesn't need those? Uh, they're really central elements uh, in, in research and teaching today. And um, so uh, we need to um, acknowledge and take credit for our, our tremendous capacity to contribute. Um, we need to build links within the library so that in fact the various departments and the various staff participating in those departments have a sense of their, uh, of their partners in addressing these issues and um, to work together to exploit the common resources. Uh, and we must partner campus-wide uh, and, um, and seek to, uh, in doing so, to expand the rich, this rich constellation of services and expertise. And expertise is a critical element, as I'll comment in just a moment. Um, but also, as I've commented, we really need to um, uh, devote a good deal of, t of attention uh, how in to how to tell the new story. Um, the old story has been around for a long time. We need to work at how to tell the new story. In addition to partnerships with IT units, teaching and learning centers, and academic departments, we must connect with university research administration. And as I said, demonstrate our importance to the research enterprise. We offer significant economies of scale for the university. And as Calgary's Associate Vice President of Research, um, Penny Pexman, said at our symposium in Washington last December, libraries can play a crucial role in developing faculty abilities and that also applies to graduate students, and initiating synergistic connections among faculty. These needs exist on every campus today. This redefinition and repositioning is what will bring us to new tables with enhanced influence and um, an enhanced recognition Thank you, Tom. How about you, Dan? Uh, that was very well put, Tom. Um, you know, I, I will add, I think all of the trends in scholarship are heading in a direction that um, we're, you know, having a digital scholarship uh, group in the library um, makes tremendous sense, right? Um, almost every field is become um, at least data inflected, if not, significantly involved in you know, the management and visualization and integration of data sources, um, you know, humanities, social sciences, um, STEM fields. Um, so, um, so I think there, you know, there's a, a clear leadership role to play. I think on the kind of um, marketing and um, attaching yourself to strategic initiatives, I think that's another good point that Tom 
would make. Um, our, uh, just one brief example, our university is really trying to make, I think particularly given what's happened this year, a very strong push to become better integrated into our community in Boston or, or um, you know, a university that sits in the middle of Boston. And um, we have tremendous archives um, of the surrounding communities and social justice groups in the area. Um, and so um, seeing that, you know, the university wants to, to make a significant advance on that front and knowing that between our archives and our digital scholarship group as again, a facilitator or enabler of um, the use and um, um, you know, visualization of our community's history and culture has been, I think, really important. Um, so I think keeping an eye on, you know, what your university's overall strategic priorities are and knowing what your strengths are um, within your uh, digital scholarship um, uh, a group would be pretty key. Um, I'll also say that um, I do think it's really important for um, leaders um, within the library to be well integrated with the other leadership structures within the university. Um, that really varies by university, but um, our terrific um, head of the digital scholarship group at Northeastern, um, Julia Flanders, many of you know, um, has a joint appointment in um, English. Um, so she's integrated into our humanities, humanities and Social Sciences College. She's also part of New Lab, um, as am I actually, as a joint faculty member appointment. And New Lab is our digital humanities and computational social sciences group, faculty driven. Um, I sit on the Dean's Council with the, the deans of the colleges themselves as an equal partner. Um, that might be an unusual experience perhaps for a dean of the library, but um, you know, I've been very gratified to sort of really have a seat and be a full participant in those things. So you know, I think um, those kinds of very strong connections are important. Um, I think the library can also facilitate that by um, thinking about, you know, exactly how you structure appointments, um, the kinds of faculty members who you bring in, um, and just doing some basic politicking, to be honest, if I can be frank, within the university to, to, to you know, have even, um, you know, mid uh, um, and entry level folks within your group um, reach out and participate in academic seminars and, get, you know, get involved with projects um, so that uh, you are valued across the university. Thank you, Dan. Patricia. You know, um, both Tom and Dan were so eloquent. I'm not sure that I have um, much more to add other than um, just keeping on top of assessment. And so, you know, Tom um, bringing up the story, I think is going to be increasingly important. Um, knowing how to tell that story, not just relying on metrics or mechanisms for analytics, but actually having stories to tell that show how um, a particular service or a particular collaboration has been effective and has shown um, you know, the, the strengths of the, of the campus um, and the faculty and the students. So um, bravo to Tom and Dan for saying all that for me. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to uh, the final question that I have, and then just to remind you, if you weren't here at the outset, after uh, our panelists answer this fourth question, we'll open it to you, the participants, for your own Q&A, and then I'm going to do a brief wrap-up of the seminar, of the webinar series. So our fourth question is, in the aftermath of the pandemic, which we're all just hoping and hoping and hoping will come sooner than later. How will digital scholarship programs change? And Dan, we're gonna start with you on this question. Uh, so yeah, just, you know, pandemic has had no effect whatsoever <laughs> in uh, our lives in, across the university and digital scholarship groups. Um, um, of, of course, I mean, look, I'll, be, I'll be brief. I, I, think, I think, you know, it makes digital scholarship work more important than ever because um, we, you know, we, they point to, we have to be more responsive, more flexible um, in the way that we do our work now. We've had to do that all year. I mean, my entire staff has had to change week to week, um, day to day. I mean, there's just 
so much going on. And, um, you know, I've always thought that one of the advantages of digital media and technology um, is that it is, it is flexible, it's adaptable, it can be used to different purposes. It, it, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a medium that is, can be highly responsive if done well. And so I just think, um, you know, we will have to continue to be very responsive to what's going on in the world around us and to use the best of digital media and technology to make better and more humane approaches to what we see. Thank you. Patricia. Um, flexibility is definitely going to be a part of it. Um, I do think that in some ways, because of the versatility of the roles and of staff in these programs, um, perhaps that's a versatility that will translate across other um, staff roles uh, in the organization. Um, uh, I know that there have been situations where because of the nature of the position or the work or the role, it's been hard to do that kind of uh, work um, from home. And maybe there'll be more imagination into ways of auto, you know, automatically or um, nimbly repurposing um, certain uh, positions or certain um, activities so that they can take place off, um, off campus. I also wonder if we'll be more attentive to challenges of continuity of service, continuity of research and teaching um, that will go beyond just holding things over Zoom. Um, you know, uh, I think that there are already groups and organizations thinking in those terms. Um, so less dependency on space. I am curious to know, um, you know, what the investments will be um, post pandemic on space, on facilities, um, given that, you know, we have not been able to take advantage of them um, because of the challenges of the pandemic. Um, so uh, I guess the only other thing is just um, understanding that the portfolio for online services is probably going to grow, um, that there'll be, you know, probably, you know, I'm thinking toolkits or guidance that will um, enable librarians and libraries to make that transition without, you know, a whole lot of um, uh, angst and, um, uh, you know, issues and problems. Thank you. And Tom. Oh, <laughs> um, not long ago, I saw an article in the New York Times about the pandemic, which was headlined in bold letters saying, no one knows what's going to happen. And that is okay. It reminds me of what I often say about designing libraries. Design for the library you know, for the library you can imagine, and for the library you cannot yet imagine. We've had months now of something most of us could not imagine. To our credit, we are accommodating the changes, but ideally we are also recognizing that the changes in research and teaching, in the student experience, and in our role in the campus community will continue beyond the pandemic and continue to change. So perhaps the best thing we can do is to recognize this and employ permeable thinking in our programming, training, and architectural and spatial design. When we built the Taylor Family Digital Library at Calgary, we had raised flooring and demountable walls installed throughout most of the building. We wanted a space that could be altered and repurposed without major construction. Today, Lab Next is a digital scholarships space created in response to researcher identified needs. It's an open and flexible space, including small workrooms and a maker space located as a hub for a constellation of related services. But it could be something else tomorrow. Hopefully, a comfort with and capacity for change is how we will deal with our current circumstance and also prepare ourselves for tomorrow. Thank you, Tom. Do any of you want to uh, add to your comments or question one of your fellow panelists or expand on your thoughts? Go ahead or raise your hand. Dan? 
Well, I'll just, I'll just say briefly, I think the space question is a really interesting one. We're actually at the beginning of a renovation of our library. And I think that point on um, Tom's third point about, you know, how do you design for a future you can't imagine is a really meaty and interesting one. And I think we agree with the direction that that question takes us. Thank you. Patricia, did you want to add something? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, again, I've learned so much from um, both uh, my colleagues um, on the panel and their comments. And I love the expression permeable thinking and um, you know, just that ability to be able to repurpose rethink um, even to some extent you know think of it as you know repair restoration um, is going to be key I think to life after the pandemic in libraries. Well thank you so much Patricia, Dan and Tom. You've provided some great perspectives on both the past and the future of digital scholarship programs and now we'll take some questions from participants and then I'll provide a brief wrap up of the series. And so if you'll put your questions into the chat, I will then uh, feed them to our panelists. So our first question is, how do you balance strategic marketing and illuminating the role of digital scholarship with very real staffing bandwidth and funding issues? So in other words, if you're out there talking up your program, but you're reaching the limitations of what your staff can handle, how do you make sure that you're somewhat keeping that in balance? Tom, do you want to address that first? Well, I, uh, I'll go back to the uh, making hard decisions. Um, and, uh, and my uh, quote of the, uh, of the uh, research uh, dean, um, parts of our, of our previous uh, traditional strengths are not as valuable today. Much more material is, avail is available through open access and through open science. And so we really have to think about what is in the 21st century, what is the most important strength, strengths of the, of the library? What are they today? And then be responsive to what will they be tomorrow? And um, uh, so, so, you know, you, 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 we all say it many times, um, the question is, what do we not do? Thank you. Patricia, any thoughts? No, I just, I was nodding because I totally agree with Tom. <laughs> what do you not do is, is going to be key to figuring out this problem of uh, bandwidth for sure. Thank you. Dan, anything to add? All right. Our next question is, what parameters do you recommend um, regarding when should library digital scholarship staff be recognized as co-authors or co-researchers. And so this could apply to publications, to presentations, et cetera. Does the Mellon Foundation have any guidelines for that or do you look at proposals for how people's roles will be recognized, Patricia? Or is that something that you think um, it, that you have some thoughts on? Um, I don't know that we, well, we want to obviously see collaborators recognized in some way on a proposal. And um, that could very well mean that if they have a major role in the effort um, that we want to see some indication that they have participated in the design of the project. Um, but when it comes to uh, actual um, parameters to recommend uh, for recognizing co-authorship or co um, or collaboration on a project, um, that's a tricky one. And I, you know, I, I, I think part of it has to do with the fact that um, these contributions, collaborative contributions aren't often recognized or um, credited by the organization. Um, and so I think I'm going to defer to my uh, panelists, my fellow panelists as to, see, and as to whether they have any ideas on that front. Thank you. Tom, we know in the sciences, there's an increasing uh, movement to have a huge list of co-authors with, in some cases, roles specified on publications. Uh, is that something that you saw at all at Calgary? Were, were some of your staff involved co-authors or co-presenters on some of the projects you work with there? 
Um, when, uh, what we saw probably more often than specifically uh, credit for, um, for a scholarly communication is the opportunity to be um, co-participants in academic grants. And um, um, for one of our literary scholars, um, her co-participants um, for a major grant uh, included the head of our uh, um, uh, spatial numeric data services because of his expertise in GIS and uh, also included uh, our visualization coordinator. Uh, and interestingly, um, we've had cases where people in digitization who are applying new methodologies uh, to produce a different kind of digital image to be incorporated into data analysis um, are also getting substantial credit. So I, um, and we've certainly done, you know, uh, we brought our partners to uh, CNI as well. And uh, uh, so uh, trying to uh, have them join with us as well as us join with them. And as a digital historian and someone who's worked on projects for many years, I'm sure you've encountered this from different perspectives as a PI and as an administrator, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I get, maybe I, this is a little too simplistic, but I sort of feel like in an era where there can be a thousand co-authors or co-researchers on an article that comes out of the um, CERN or the Large Hadron Collider, I think we can credit eight or 10 other <laughs> people on our digital scholarship program. I, it doesn't seem like we're wasting that many pixels to really let everyone who's been involved in the project um, share at least a bit in the limelight. Um, I think it's essential for morale. And frankly, I just think it's ethically right that if a librarian or an archivist or software developer has contributed to the conceptualization or made some really key tweak that enables the, the, the sort of front end scholarship, the analytical part to be better realized, then that person should be credited. And I think it's, it's healthy for an organization to provide more widespread credit. Um, and also, I think a way forward for, um, again, the, the true recognition of the role that these groups play across the university. Thank you. Our next question is one that I'm sure is on the minds of lots of our participants. Where would you advise a library that doesn't yet have a strong central digital scholarship services team or department to start? What would be the essential uh, supporting positions and skills? And note that the library may have some of these things in, in existence, but they're not coordinated or, or you know, uh, marketed in that way. Who would like to start? Tom? So just a, a quick um, comment is to, uh, as, as the questioner has, has mentioned, is to recognize that what we have to do is provide a constellation uh, of, of services. And they must be conveyed in a, in a unified fashion. But in many cases, we already have, have many of the strengths. We just need, <clears throat> pardon me, we just need to be able to bring them to bear uh, in, a, in a successful and in, impactful fashion. Um, and one of the things that I found particularly important in doing that is someone who is a coordinator who works between the various uh, library units, but also interacts directly with the researchers. Researchers don't know how to go from one spot in the library to another spot to another spot. So we need a coordinator to actually give um, uh, a coherent uh, response to the research need. Thank you. We're gonna take one final question and then I'm going to do a wrap up. The question is, uh, 
do you cut the baby in half kind of question. Just prior to the pandemic, we received funding from the provost to renovate space to create a digital scholarship center. The design plans for which it had already been put on hold once, but now funding has been paused. But they also need additional staff positions and expertise to implement their programmatic vision. Should we continue to advocate for the build out of a digital scholarship center or instead focus on expanding staff expertise as our top funding focus? So, you know, I don't know this individual's in this institution, nor do you, and I'm sure there are many factors involved, but do you have any advice to provide? Um, like I'll to? just say that digital scholarship is people. At the end of the day, it's people much more than space. Um, and just back to Tom's point, you know, we don't know what the future is going to hold. I mean, there have been libraries that have built out giant VR centers. I'm not sure that VR is the future. I don't even know what's going to happen in five or 10 years. So to me, I, I think the most important thing is to stock your institution with talented people. That is the number one thing to do. I think Tom is absolutely right that if you have someone, in a sense, do a survey and catalog all those talents so that you can provide a menu of services from your existing staff, someone might have a little bit of specialty here or there, you can essentially organically start to build out a digital scholarship group um, without renovating a space and um, hardwiring a whole bunch of things together before you actually have the, the expertise to really staff it and to pursue the kinds of questions that you'd like to pursue. Dan, uh, I hope our panelists don't mind if I give you the last word there so that I have a little time for the wrap up. And I hope you'll join me in thanking our speakers. If they're able to stay, uh, we'll continue our discussion uh, after my wrap up. But thank you so very, very much for your time, your expertise, for sharing those viewpoints with us. And now I'm going to do a very brief wrap up. And first, I want to say once again, thank you so much to our panelists, Dan Cohen, Tom Hickerson, Patricia Sway, but also a big thank you to CNI. Clifford Lynch enthusiastically approved the proposal I made to do this webinar series. And I've received support from Diane Goldenberg Hart, Jackie Udell, Sharon Adams, Angelo Cruz, and Beth Secrest. They're responsible for the website, for the registration process, for the listserv, for getting those videos up and out so very quickly. And I owe them a lot. So thank you. So I want to just reinforce some of the things I've taken away from the series. Some are reinforcing viewpoints already held. Some have changed my thinking about some things. But at its heart, I think it's so important to understand that digital scholarship programs support the core mission of the university in research, in learning, and in service or community. And understanding how to articulate that to administrators and to staff in the library and around the university is critically important, I think. And I think it's also important to understand as you're developing a program, whether you're at the beginning or at a stage where you're expanding your program, to think about what kind of program you're developing. And I would say you might be starting at the service provider role, which is fine and really important. Most programs really want to become genuine collaborators in at least some of the projects with which they work. But Greg Rashke in our previous session on space and place talked about also the role of the library as expanding the idea of the possible. And it's somewhat akin to Tom Hickerson saying, imagining what you can't even imagine at this point. And he says it in a much more articulate way. But having that expertise and showcasing new forms of scholarship may spark ideas of researchers, graduate students, and even undergraduates about what's possible in their own discipline and move them into new areas. I also think it's continually important for libraries to stress that they are the neutral ground. They are the place 
where interdisciplinary research and projects can flourish, when multidisciplinary research can flourish, and they provide opportunities for students and faculties in all discipline, disciplines to participate in new forms of research learning and communication of research results, regardless of whether they have the funds to be able to do that in their home departments or colleges. And as we've heard today and in some of the earlier webinars, administrative leadership is key. And by this, I'm talking about administrative leadership in the library at the dean and director level, and to me also very importantly at the associate university librarian level, communicating to staff what this is about, what new forms of research are about, and why the library is doing it. There are a lot of people in libraries who still will say, I don't understand why the library is doing this. And they, it needs to be communicated in a clear and, and uh, really in, impactful statement. Establishing digital scholarship as a priority for the library, clearly doing so, not having it as an add-on peripheral service, and that it does involve rethinking staff roles. We've heard this theme of collaboration throughout the webinar series, and at the institutional level, it means having a seat at many of the tables, as we talked about today. It's particularly important when there's institution-wide planning going on for infrastructure, and it enables the library, if they're at these tables, to seek partners for particular projects or particular initiatives, to get to know people, both at the administrative level and at the grassroots uh, level. And for me, and this is something I don't hear as much about, but as an outsider from, I worked in four universities before I came to CNI, but now I look at university programs from an outsider's viewpoint. And I often wonder how researchers and students have a clue where to go for particular types of help or technology or expertise, because it's usually scattered around campus and there's no coherent view into that suite of services, expertise, and technologies. Collaboration within the library is incredibly important. We've heard that today emphasized many times, that if there may be a core team of identifiable digital scholarship staff, but there need to be clear roles and responsibilities for staff in all kinds of other areas. And there need to be rewards for that participation. It has to be taken into account in uh, annual reviews and in promotion and tenure decisions, if, if that applies in your library. Creating a program for your institution, that's really a lot of what this series has been about. Whether you're starting at the early stages or you're rethinking the next stage of your program. I certainly encourage you to start with a needs assessment. How, how extensive it is depends on what you already know about your audience, about other partners on campus, etc. But you need to know what are critical areas for your institution, both institutional priorities and where the gaps are in your institution. For example, I know of uh, universities where the geography department has the GIS software, but there's no place on campus where someone in uh, history can come and get expertise and access to technology for GIS, that kind of thing. It's a gap. Uh, importantly, you need to have clear discussions about how you'll address diversity, equity, and inclusion issues throughout the digital scholarship program both in collections, in service, in priorities, and in, uh, in public programming. You need to think about what staff are available, how you'll retrain staff, how you'll repurpose positions when you're able to fill them. And I know that's a, a really worrisome area right now with the pandemic. And where you should start, we had that question and we had uh, some response to that. We might have more discussion at the end if you'd like. And then how will you know if you're successful? We do have a lot of assessment at the front end of the program, but very little in midpoints. And trying to develop some parameters, and I don't necessarily need, mean metrics or numbers, 
but some idea of what constitutes success for your program, I think is really important to have those discussions and then to sit down and say, each year, how did we do? Where could we do better? How do we change our priorities and move forward? Now, space and place, while I do agree that having the right staff on board and enough staff is even more important than space and place, I still believe that space and place remain highly desirable as integral parts of programs. And I'm not saying that our panelists disagree with that. But most importantly, what we've seen during the pandemic with teaching and learning in particular is students miss community. And in di digital scholarship, so much is done in collaboration and through communities. And yes, there are many virtual digital scholarship communities and that can be part of it. But we also know that so much peer learning and collaboration goes on in digital scholarship spaces. People build upon each other, they spark ideas, and they teach each other things. In addition, those spaces often become windows, often because they literally have glass walls into what libraries offer. So they serve as their own public relations and communications about what libraries do today. And particularly if they offer exhibits of the products of digital scholarship, both from faculty and students, I think are critically important. So I want to remind you that this webinar series has the components of videos of each one of these sessions, along with a brief campus discussion guide of three to five questions per segment. And I'd really love it if you send me examples of how you might use these on your campus to do some planning discussions. You can ask members of your planning group to watch the videos asynchronously and then hold a Zoom session or in some of your cases an on-campus session where you discuss a particular aspect of the program. Whether you do it in sequence, whether you pick or choose, it really doesn't matter, but I would really hope that these help you in your own campus planning. You need to start thinking now, I'm sure you, you already are, uh, thinking about reopening, whether it's partial reopening or full reopening. I don't mean most, many of your libraries have some reopening right now, but not so many have opened their digital scholarship spaces. And use this time when you're partially open or closed to communicate with staff, your user community, and new and current partners about what you're doing and what you would like to be doing with them. So that's really uh, what I wanted to cover as my wrap up. I'd like you to please complete an evaluation form. I'll send you a link to the evaluation form in an email this week. It doesn't matter if you've only come to one session or several or all of them. I would really appreciate if you would complete the form. Also, CNI is looking to that evaluation to see where they might go for future programs. And please feel free to email me your comments and suggestions. But most of all, I thank all the presenters, our wonderful panelists today, as well as presenters from our previous sessions, and a big, big thank you to all of our participants. So I'm going to stop my screen share and then move back to the discussion. I see we're beyond time uh, at this point, but uh, if you have further questions, I'll try to um, feed them to our panelists. And uh, once again, I thank you very much. Mm -hmm.